This week in Texas politics started out with a little house fighting, some house cleaning, and a road rage settlement. We'll get to all that in just a moment, but first let's get to our headlines from our panel, and we'll start first with political analyst Mark Wiggins. Mark, what's your headline for the week? Quiet quitting the special session. Connie Sweeney with the Highlander. Connie, what's your headline for the week? Taxpayers balk at a series of strikeouts and payouts. And Annie Spillman, who tracks business issues under the Capitol Dome. Annie, what's your headline for the week? Why the hell are we here? This week started with some House bills finally being pushed out of House committees, things like a COVID vaccination mandate ban and some immigration enforcement ideas. Mark, do you think that these have the best chance to give Governor Greg Abbott a win? You know, so Rudy, the governor promised a special session on vouchers, but it was pretty clear that a voucher wasn't going to pass. So what do you do then? So you expand the call. Right now what we have is, is sort of a mix of some long shots and some low hanging fruit like the COVID vaccine bill, which is an issue that excites a portion of his base without being too complex to pass. And he preventing private business from having a vax policy for its employees seems to be against fair market values. What are you hearing from the business community? Well, um, interestingly, when, you know, previously when I've uh, polled employers across the state of Texas, the majority of employers, particularly small business employers, um, have not required the vaccination uh, and don't intend to. You know, I, I think what we need to think about when we're uh, proposing legislation like this is it's legislation that, you know, it's, it's, it's stepping into the employer-employee relationship, and that can have unintended consequences. Obviously, this is a narrow call uh, relating to the COVID vac vaccination, but, you know, when we pass legislation, we're essentially giving future legislatures permission to step inside this arena. And so while it has to do with vaccinations at this point, um, you know, telling an employer they cannot do something uh, in regard to running their business. Uh, now we've sort of opened Pandora's box. Connie, how's this vax ban bill playing out in the Hill Country? Rudy, here in the Hill Country, uh, it looks like the healthcare workers took the brunt of the COVID, max, uh, the COVID vaccine mandates during the pandemic. So it, there may be a little bit more support for allowing this to be recommended instead of mandatory. Uh, it was a herd mentality that sort of drove the rest into becoming compliant with these kind of things. Uh, right now, because of the, the bad taste folks had in their mouth about what happened during the pandemic, it seems as though there may be a push more towards medical choices that are voluntary versus collective mandates. A hearing was held earlier this week on a controversial development known as Colony Ridge. Critics claim that it's nothing more than a very large, unregulated sanctuary city. Annie, this is a hot button border issue, but for the developers, you know, they follow county rules. They have county rules. Is this a dangerous precedent that may be doing something with this? What kind of rules could be coming out of this? Right. Well, Rudy, again, once again, this is a sticky wicket. Um, you know, Governor Abbott and leadership want to address legislation concerning public safety, security, and environmental quality. And in doing that, again, once again, we're looking at opening Pandora's box. Um, you know, this type of legislation could potentially back groups like the Texas Home Builders Association into a corner, as well as pro-business legislators. Um, you know, typically when we see legislation that's looking to have a heavy hand on these types of industries, developers and home builders, um, that's typically coming from the labor union side. So this could this could be quite interesting. Mark, is this really just a sideshow for the hard right and the GOP? Well, I mean, you can't turn on Fox without seeing Colony Ridge at some point. And it's become such a hot topic in that sphere that you can't ignore it, especially if you're a Republican governor and it's happening in your state. But that said, it's a pricklier thing to solve for all the reasons that Annie just mentioned. And that makes it potentially dangerous uh, if you can't show the base a clear win on this. How's this playing over there in the Hill Country? Because, you know, these developments, that development, Culinary Ridge looks like a development that could be out there in Marble Falls. Local politicians, like in other counties, are, are telling me that they have little teeth when it comes to regulating some of these developments. 
And so you might see a growing support for what's happening at the state level. The House Bill 4 may be something that I guess the conservatives can hang their hat on. But at the same time, you have these fears that are being stoked by these potential developments, hiding what's going on with the, the cartels or perhaps human trafficking being a safe haven for those kinds of activities. So th this may be why you'll see a wellspring of support for any kind of state regulation with developments like these. An ugly game of highway chicken between Republicans and Democrats has cost the city of San Marcos uh, several thousand dollars. A settlement was reached with organizers of a Biden campaign bus trip that got harassed by Trump supporters on I-35 a few years ago. Do you all think that this could prompt some type of new law enforcement across uh, action across Texas where they kind of crack down on a lot of these events? Annie, I'll start with you. You know, I don't see how we can expect uh, law enforcement to ramp up security at events when we're losing folks who don't want to serve or those who serve and are wary to engage because of cell phone cams, um, you know, low pay, et cetera. But, you know, unfortunately, we've seen a, a, a surge in these vigilante groups um, and we just purely lack the amount of security that we need to protect our communities. And I think what you're going to see, especially with all the fodder happening around Speaker Phelan and, you know, his his leadership and, you know, the folks that are going to be primaried by the far, far right and some folks that are Trump supporters. Um, you know, I'm afraid that you might see some instances pop up in those districts. Um, and that's, you know, that's worrisome. Connie, what do you think? You know, people are angry. People get ramped up during these events. And, and sometimes law enforcement just doesn't want to, to get involved. But then they've got to. What do you think? $87,000, Rudy, that's basically yes. what the city of San Marcos is going to pay. And that means the taxpayers are left on the hook for that. It, at the same time, the city of San Marcos had said that they're going to do this payout settlement. They also said that they really weren't to blame for what went on. So it makes me think that perhaps there's not going to be any changing in policing, uh, even though they are trying to avoid some costly legal costs in the future. Mark, the Travis County DA has been indicting police officers who got a little heavy handed with some protest. So is this settlement going to send a message or is it just, you know, not going to do anything? You know, I, I hate to sound pessimistic, but I think we got to be real, Rudy. I mean, this is the sort of thing that the ex-president encourages. And, you know, I wouldn't expect to, to see any less of it uh, during this upcoming campaign season. And, you know, there are more and more phones and cameras out there in the world. And I would expect to see more of it. Former President Trump may get bit by a Texas lawyer who calls herself the Kraken. Sidney Powell, who was part of the Trump election campaign team, cut a deal this week and pled guilty to several misdemeanor charges in that Georgia election interference case. Is this a Texas twist, Connie, or a political ripple? It appears that detractors may be looking for that guilt by association. Here in the Hill Country, though, however, the legal issues faced by a Dallas attorney in the state of Georgia don't seem to be resonating very much. What, it's still those basic issues, uh, the inflation, the cost of eggs, the border crisis that tend to be sucking the air out of any conversation about national politics. Annie, this is the first time that we've had that Georgia issue kind of impact, you know, come home to Texas. Does it come home to the Texas ballot box? You know, I think, um, unfortunately, you're going to have your hardliners and you're going to have your folks that are Trump supporters or they're not Trump supporters. Um, I think you're going to see the, the Trump influence show up in a lot of those House races that I mentioned previously. Um, you know, a lot of the Speaker Phelan um, leadership, those who that have been deemed rhinos, and uh, a lot of the House folks that supported um you know, the impeachment of the attorney general. Um, so you'll see that name pop up there to sort of out conservative, you know, the conservative. On the other hand, um, I think, you know, especially with this and the, and the Trump name and, and, and the pleading guilty, um, you will also see some union organizers try to jump on that in Texas and in an effort to, you know, uh, turn Texas purple, blue. Um, so I, I think it might have an impact, but truly, you know, you've got your Trump supporters, or your non-Trump supporters. Mark, it's just misdemeanor charges. It's not going to be the felony charges. So do you really think that she's going to provide something that's going to hurt Trump? Zero impact on the primary. All right. Here's the other hot topic. 
Officials with Defend Texas Liberty PAC did some house cleaning this week. They replaced their leader, Jonathan Sticklin, who met with a Nazi sympathizer a few weeks ago, caused a huge storm, political storm here in Austin. Annie, I don't know if there is enough, uh, uh, if this is enough to really save face for the PAC. Do you think it's gonna save face? Does this give them a new clean slate? No, I don't. I think it's going to take, you know, we've, we've seen that, um, you know, obviously they have new leadership supposedly with Luke Macias, who's a longtime conservative uh, consultant and, and activist. Um, we don't know uh, what role Stickland may still play. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that you've got Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who did denounce Fuentes, um, but he's said there's no reason to give the money back. And there's uh, several other folks who um, are, are not going to be returning the money. And as a matter of fact, uh, Lieutenant Governor doubled down by saying that Speaker Phelan has orchestrated a smear campaign around this. Um, so again, I think this is going to be a hard line. Um, you've got the folks that are um, in the Republican Party that are considered more moder moderate, and then you're going to have the, the far right red who you know, that aren't going to return the money that might still align themselves with the, you know, the PAC. And um, is it going to hurt them in their districts? No, uh, because they're, they're hard, you know, hard conservative right districts. The Texas GOP chairman was seen uh, around the building where this meeting took place. Mark, does this give him now a free pass? Rudy, these guys are all so thoroughly discredited at this point. And the people who built the RPT into the most powerful state party in America are aghast at how it's been mismanaged. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see more heads roll here. Connie, Nazis in the house, is this playing out? Is this resonating in the Hill Country? Well, I'm hard pressed here in the Hill Country to find uh, people who are detractors of Defend Texas Liberty, even though they gave that money, uh, $3 million to the Lieutenant Governor. And what I'm saying is that there's a doubling down in support whenever there's a doubling in, down in attacks and so even though um, there has been some connections that have ma been made and there's been a cut and run um, sort of a, a stance from that pack, it, it doesn't appear as though Lieutenant Governor is losing his base of support. The Texas Secretary of State released the preliminary findings of an audit of the November election in Harris County. It confirms multiple failures took place there and seems to justify the changes that lawmakers made during the regular session. Mark, elect election confidence, it's been saved, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I wouldn't go that far, Rudy. You know, this is all probably helpful from a pragmatic policy standpoint, but election confidence in general, it's not going to be saved as long as you have politicians that are out there trying to undermine that confidence for political reasons. Come on, Connie. Election confidence has been saved in the hell country. The, the Secretary of State's done something, right? Well, the findings did also reinforce some of the concerns that people had about what was going on in the metropolitan cities with their voting system. Now, the downside is, uh, folks, it, it did little to kind of build some confidence uh, in that kind of system. But the upside is this, putting a microscope on Harris County may result in to some improvements. And in the long term, we could see the confidence in the voting system improve, which also could lead to improvements uh, for the system in the entire state. That's a good point. Uh, Annie, is this a warning shot to the other blue counties in the state? I think it should be. And if anybody knows the history of the Secretary of State, Jane Nelson, they'll know that um, she, she means what she says and she does what she means. Um, and so I absolutely think that you'll see the same, you know, audits in, in more of our urban and, uh, and blue counties. And, you know, coming from someone who, you know, she served in the Texas Senate for many, many years, I don't necessarily think this would be like an attack on the blue counties per se, but um, just more of a transparency issue and in, in her trying to be an active secretary of state, in my opinion. The Texas State House has finally got into the voucher game somewhat. HB1 was dropped and filed late Thursday night. It is somewhat of a kitchen sink approach to education reform with a pilot program approach to vouchers. Mark, is this the, is this the uh, compromise? No, there is no compromise. There will be no compromise. Um, like this bill is 180 pages of unrelated nonsense. It's going to take weeks to unravel and decipher. Doesn't have the support of the governor or even his own caucus. So I, I doubt this really does anything at all. HB1 has more money for teachers, but also makes it a pilot program for the vouchers. Annie, that's got to be a compromise. 
You would think, um, I think that this bill is just um, really surrounded by total politics at this point. Um, there's no sense of urgency on the House's side to move this bill. Um, and I think they're gonna take their time. Uh, you've seen them move on some of these other pieces of legislation that we spoke about today. Um, and I think, you know, they're gonna just sort of try to distract, distract, distract um, while negotiations happen behind the scenes. You know, Connie, they were saying that, you know, passage in the house hinges on rural counties. What, could this be what brings rural guys in? Rudy, I believe that our local school superintendents are not supportive of any kind of voucher system. And they've been outspoken about it during the public school board meetings. Uh, the superintendent of Marble Falls ISD made it clear that he wants some sort of solution other than the possibility of taking public funding from the public schools and then being diverted into other areas, private entities and charter schools. So I think it does little to boost uh, any kind of confidence that this will be beneficial to rural school districts. Let's wrap up this week with one word and we'll start it off with Connie. What's your word for the week, Connie? Settlement. Annie, what is your word for the week? Uncertainty. And Mark Wiggins, close us out with a word. Dired. And with that, we'll say it's another week in Texas politics.